So, we are in Philippians, <laughs> chapter 3. Amen. So, surprise, surprise, surprise. Now, when we last left off in this exciting study, we had just started uh, Philippians, chapter 3, and we covered verses 1 through 3. And uh, so now we're going to... We're going to kind of go on to uh, verses 4 through 6. Uh, but I'll, when I read the scriptures this morning, we'll start from verse 1 because at the end of verse 3 gives us the context uh, to go into uh, this uh, study of uh, what we'll be talking about today. So I'm going to be in uh, the book of Philippians, a New Testament epistle by Paul. Uh, and I'm in chapter 3, and I'll start at verse 1, and uh, I will read down to verse 6. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherefore, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So let's uh, focus here on, on verse three. There's there's two words. Uh, yeah, verse three. There's two words that uh, we're going to set the context here of what this study is going to be in verses four through six. In verse three, we read that for we are of the circumcision which worship God in the in the spirit. Okay, and then he goes on and he says, uh, and have no confidence in the flesh. And if you remember the study that we did in verses 1 through 3, we talked about, uh, uh, about the flesh, right? And we had a, a pretty good study on the mind, remember? <laughs> no, you don't, okay. But we did have a good study. It was a great study on the mind, so seeing that you don't remember. So, matter of God, so. Oh, at any rate. So, we see that the, the context here going into verse 4 is we worship God in the spirit and we should have no confidence in the flesh. And now, what Paul does is he provides us an excellent example. He provides himself as an example of self righteousness. And, and when you kind of look at uh, religion, and self-righteousness, it kind of goes hand in hand, right? There's really two types of unbelievers, if you will. There are the self-righteous, and we're going to be talking about that in pretty good detail today. And then there's the agnostic, or, or the people that just don't believe God. So, But it's interesting that if you're self-righteous, uh, I can't think of any example... Uh, but maybe there is, but in order to be self-righteous, uh, you need to be religious. And so kind of think on that and, 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 and marinate on that. Uh, religion basically will promote self-righteousness. When, when you witness, uh, we'll pick on the Catholics or whatever, when you, when you witness to a Catholic... Uh, the bottom line is, why, why will they reject you? Why will they reject the biblical source of salvation? Because of their other sources? Yeah, because they think what? That they're correct. That, that, they're correct. That, the, that, that what they've been taught, right, the seven sacraments, right, mm -hmm. are, and when you really boil it down, it's, it's the, that their religion has given them an assurance in their self-righteousness. And we see here, Paul goes on into this in pretty good detail. And now in verse 4, we see, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath where, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. 
And when we study these, uh, these scriptures here, it gives us an excellent view into Paul in his pre-saved state. Uh, so uh, Paul considered himself, when, when you kind of study this out, he considered himself not only, it says that he's a, a stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, a Pharisee, uh, um, a Hebrew of Hebrew. He actually considered himself a super Hebrew. Yeah. Very, very self-righteous. And, 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 he, and he uses that to kind of talk about and warn the self-righteous people that regardless of what you think of yourself, uh, all that, as we go on, as we'll study more in chapter 3, is meaningless, is worthless. And he, he goes into some pretty good detail of, of how worthless this mindset was. Uh, but, all right, so let, let's kind of start. It says, uh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So we're going we're gonna to hunker down on this word confidence. It was an interesting study in the scripture. The word confidence pops up in the scripture 38 times. And in the Old, in the Old Testament, there's really only two contexts that it falls under. When the word is referenced in any verse in the Old Testament uh, relating to trust towards God, those are the positive contexts. All the negative contexts, other th when, when you look at any other verses in the Old Testament, the old, it's a negative context. And so I've put out some verses that will kind of talk about that. Also, uh, interesting enough, when we talk about the New Testament, the word, the word confidence appears, and, I, and it's a little bit different context. There's three different contexts in the New Testament when the word appears. The first context is when you see the word confident, it's usually associated with assurance. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll read about that. Then there's, uh, in Philippians, is really the only two negative uh, uh, contexts, and that's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And then, there, what I was surprised to discover, there's a third context in the New Testament, and it deals with confidence in believers, which I thought was very interesting. So we'll, we'll get to those uh, We'll, we'll get to those verses as we study through this. But for right now, let's kind of go through and we'll go back into the Old Testament. And there's just, it's kind of black and white. There's just two, two contexts in the Old Testament with the word confidence. We'll start off with Psalm chapter 65, verse 5. We'll start off with the uh, the positive context. All right, Psalm uh, Psalm sixty five verse five. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are far off upon the sea. So, how far does God's confidence extend? Of all the ends of the earth. Yeah. Uh, we'll go to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26. And this I find, this verse I find uh, uh, very meaningful because when we, we're studying the topic of self righteousness, and uh, this kind of this kind of just hits it right on the head. We're in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26. It says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. So 
What would be the uh, the first thing when if you wanted to put confidence in the Lord, which what should be one of the first characteristics? Fear. Yeah, you better fear him. <laughs> Not fear him in the sense that uh, he's he's a uh, 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 an overmaster and browbeat you, but in the sense of his awesome power. Right? In the in the gospels, Jesus says, Don't fear anybody that can just kill you. Fear what? Yeah, fear somebody, fear someone that could kill you and then cast you into hell. That's, that's who you fear. And when you think about people with self-righteousness, uh, the typical example is, is uh, if you witness to uh, a self-righteous person, they always follow the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. Uh, everybody, uh, yeah, well, I, I follow the Ten Commandments. So you never, you never disobey the Ten Commandments. Oh, no, no, I'm, so... And the bottom line is, is when you boil that down, do they fear God? No. 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 Let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 26. Yeah, we're staying in Proverbs. We're just going to flip back to the beginning. Uh, chapter 3. Verse 26. Does anybody have that? Yeah. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. That, so I, I, so those are just kind of a sample of the uh, verses that are in the Old Testament in the positive context. And I selected this one because it says, for the Lord shall be thy confidence. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, uh, if you're going to be self-righteous, there's two things you can be confident uh, There's actually only one thing you can be confident in is what? Your righteousness, your personal righteousness. But what the Bible is teaching us is where do we put our confidence? In the Lord. So let's go to, uh, let's look at some negative context within the Old Testament. And the first one that I always think of, because I always, uh, uh, I always think of this as the central verse in the Bible. And I know that there's uh, discrepancies on that, but let's go to Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. When I think of the word confidence, uh, this is the first verse that pops in my mind. All the time. Uh, verse 118.8. And I, I think the way that it came out, I think we talked about this. Okay? I think if you do, if you split up the Bible by verses, this is the middle verse of the Bible. If you split it up by words, I think, or there was some other way. They split it up, and it's another verse. But if, I think, I'm pretty sure that if you split the Bible up by the number of verses in there, and uh, this would be the center verse. I think they actually said that the words, the Lord, are the two middle words in the Bible. Oh, really? Wow, that, that's, that's even better. This is what someone said. Mm -hmm. Psalm 118.8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in, in man. So that, that just kind of sums it up right there. Then, and then if you continue reading, what's it say? Better to trust the Lord with confidence in princes. In princes, yes. Presidents. And the context of princes would be what? People in authority. Yeah, people in the name of government and stuff. So, okay. So if anybody here is, is leaning towards the socialists or whatever, no. <laughs> you're going to be disappointed. I recently had to register a vehicle, so uh, so you go up on the DMV site and it says by appointment only, and there's only three motor vehicle offices in the entire state open, Weathersfield, Hampton, and Bridgeport. I said, okay, I, so I, uh, I sign up for an 11 a.m. appointment to register my vehicle in Weathersfield, and I get there, and there's a line in the parking lot just across the whole parking lot. So I go in there, well, I'm not gonna wait in line. I got an appointment. So I go right up to the front of the line and I tell the security guard, it's about 10.30 in the morning. Uh, I go up to the security guard and I said, excuse me, but I have an 11 o'clock appointment here at the motor vehicle. So, so right here, I got the document. Oh, yeah, okay, uh, in the end of the line. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? 
So my 11 o'clock appointment turned out to be 12.30 wow. when I finally got in. But as I was standing in line, I couldn't help but outwardly say, let's hear it for the socialists. <laughs> this is socialism at its finest. So it baffles my mind how anybody could think of socialism as a path. Uh, when it's even proven, it's proven you have examples in the government today in the United States how it would just be an epic failure. The DMV being a perfect example. Another perfect example that everybody overlooks is the state and federal unions. Let's go in, let's concentrate on state and city unions. What has bankrupt all the cities in the north? The unions. The unions. Was bankrupt most of the states up north or put them in deficits galore? The unions. Now, this isn't a debate about pro or con union. What I try to focus on is, is this is a perfect example of the government not being able to live up to their word. Right? They promised these people that, and they signed these contracts for all these massive benefits without a care in the world about the spending, and now the chicken has come home to roost, and where's the money? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But that, right there is your perfect example. You know, I would love to get some airtime on TV. You want socialism? Look what government did with the, with the state union. Look what Connecticut did with the state unions. Look at Hartford. Look at Bridgeport. That's all, that's all because of, of union obligations, of contract obligations, of benefits. And now you're going to, so you're going to provide free health care, free education, free this, free that. You can't even pay pension people. Never mind the entire population. And so when I think about this, my mind just explodes on how in the world could you possibly vote for somebody like that? I, I mean, it's just it's just sheer ignorance. Yes. All those benefits to just for illegal aliens. Oh, we won't even get into that. Yeah. So, yeah, you're better off being illegal than a citizen here. So, how did how did we segue into that? I don't know how we. Did it. How did we segue? Oh yeah, princes, princes. It's all scriptural then. So, uh, verse uh, Psalm 118, 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in? Yeah. Well, that's 18. In 19, it's princes. Okay. All right. Shame on you for getting off track like that. Let's reel us back in. You may get the challenge once this is up on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My name is Ernie Allen. I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> Uh, verse uh, uh, Proverbs twenty five nineteen. Does anybody have that? Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Ouch! Are you yeah. sure ouch! 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 Okay, what? Twenty. Uh, uh, confidence in uh, uh, Proverbs 25 19. Okay. Confidence in an unfaithful man in the time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Wow. In other words, it's going to be painful. Hey. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's this kind of sisters along with Psalm 118.9. 9. So uh, for those people that are going to put their confidence in an unsaved Joe Biden, yeah. I won't wish you Godspeed. But it's going to be painful. It's going to be painful. So, and then we'll wrap up in uh, Micah chapter seven, verse five. These are just a just a handful. I, I believe the way it was broken down. There's 20 references to confidence in the Old Testament, 18 in the New Testament. So I just kind of pick some uh, just to kind of highlight the, the contrast and the difference. Does anybody have Micah seven five? Yeah. Trust you. 
Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Mm -hmm. So, well, in the Old Testament, it, it clearly points to, if you're going to put confidence in anything, it's to the Lord. If you, in the context, if you put confidence in anything else besides the Lord, the context is always negative. Always. Now, I'm going to go to a portion of scripture here. Uh, when we talk, and we'll talk a little bit about the self-righteousness and stuff. This portion of scripture that I'm going to uh, uh, refer to here in a minute, to me, is one of the most astounding uh, uh, portions of scripture, I think, anywhere in the Bible. It just, it blows me away. And that, we could find that in Job. Or, if you're a Bible scholar, that would be Job. <laughs> Job, chapter 40. Now the context, we'll set the context of this is uh, throughout all Job, everybody obviously knows that the, the Lord allowed Satan to attempt Job. And Job went through some tremendous trials. And then uh, he had some, he had three excellent friends that provided excellent counsel. That I'm sure that if he put his confidence in them, he would have been fine. And so, uh, so the book kind of volleys from one friend talking and then Job responding, and then the next friend talking, and then Job responding, and so forth. And then you get that, then you get to the end, I believe if we pick it up in, in chapter 39, uh, the Lord starts talking with Job, and, and Job, uh, in, in, 30, in chapter 39, he goes on and uh, just filled with self-pity and self-righteousness. And then we go into 40, and then, and I could, not that you could picture the Lord, but you just kind of just picture, I, I always, when, we, when I read this or whatever, I'm always thinking as the, uh, what, what, what did the Lord look like as he's listening to Job ramble on, okay? And then he, then he gets to, uh, to chapter 40, verse 6, and <clears throat> then the Lord kind of, Answers it, and I find these. I find this portion of scripture to, to just be mind-boggling. Can Can you imagine you're having a personal conversation with the Lord God Almighty of the universe, and this is what He's telling you? That would straighten me up pretty quick. Wow! This. I mean, just think about think about the situation here. Okay, and then. Verse, uh, I'll, I'll begin in, in verse 6. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, <laughs> Gird up thy loins, loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold everyone that is proud, and abase him. Look on everyone that is proud, and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together, and bind their faces in secret. And this verse just blows me away. Verse 14. Then, and only then, will I confess unto thee that thy own right hand can save thee. God has the, God, Lord Almighty, has, is the only person with authority that can offer you salvation. Amen. And when you think about when you think about these set of scriptures, uh, it just comes to mind that a, a, a verse in Psalm: "Every man at his best state is altogether what vanity." Vanity. So you could pick the very best minute of your very best day. That you think you are the most righteous 
We won't even go a minute. You could the best second of the best minute of the best day of the best year of your life. And what is it? Vanity. Vanity. It is nothing. Absolutely nothing. So if you don't have the ability to save yourself, then what's the point? And, and does anybody find this portion of scripture? It is, it, I mean, to, to talk to the God of the universe, the God that created you. And, uh, and, and I like, it says, gird, uh, verse 7, gird the, up thy loins, now like a man. So, so obviously God wouldn't make it in today's world because that's very, what, offensive. Right? Gird your loins up like a man. Wow, how offensive is that? I mean, just think, just think about how far society has fallen. Like that. Well, when you can even read this verse here, people are offended. Seventy percent of the people will be offended. He said he gets six sexes. Sexism at your finest. Okay. All right. Now the New Testament. We'll go on to the New Testament. Does anybody remember? There's three contexts in the New Testament. Okay, there's the positive context, the negative context, and then there's a third context, which I which I, I did not, I was not aware of. Confidence in each other. Yeah, confidence in believers, yeah. Which, uh, you know, I, when you say it or whatever, you kind of scratch your head, why would you do that? But there's the scriptural references to it and stuff, so we'll, we'll look at it. Okay, so uh, Acts chapter uh, 28, verse 31. Twenty-eight, thirty-one, or go to the very last verse in the book of Acts, whichever is easier. The context is well. The, well, the context is is. Uh, what, what what is the kind of the subject matter of, of the of the subject or whatever? So in right. other words, what you know, or the topic, the topic I should say. Did you teach it before? The, the three here? Yeah. No, no. I just uh, I, I I just came across it. I was I was I was studying. I, I did a I, I did a, a word study on confidence, and as I was reading in the New Testament, I see these verses coming up talking about confidence in believers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's like, well, so it's not, it, it's in a positive context, and, and, but it's, it's uh, a confidence in something other than, like in the Old Testament, it's black and white. It's either confidence in God or confidence in, uh, in, in yourself or, 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 or anything other than God, and that's negative and, and then positive. In the New Testament, we have the positive, which we're going to read the negative, but then Paul talks about his confidence in other believers. So, which, and we'll get to the well, we'll get to the proper context of that confidence is through the Lord. So, so it's still positive, and it's still through the Lord, but it, it brings up a different uh, a different angle. Yeah, but how can you have confidence in believers if they're still man? Well, we'll read. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll go to the Bible and we'll see. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 30, 28, verse thirty one. Right. It says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no, no man forbidding him. Who, uh, who are we talking about here first? Paul. Paul. Paul is, he's imprisoned, right? And he's in Rome, and, but he still is able to, uh, to preach the gospel. And what does it say? It says, with all confidence. Confidence in who? Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why I picked this verse is because when we start studying, when we get into uh, verse uh, 5 and 6, and we see how much confidence Paul had in his righteousness, uh, I, I picked this verse here as one of the positives that uh, it, it talk about a complete 180 change. Uh, it, it really is. Does somebody have their hand up for? Uh, 
Actually, I would say it was in prison. He was more like a house arrest. House arrest, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's true, yeah. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. This is, uh, when I was talking about the context here of assurance, a lot of the verses in the New Testament where the word confidence comes in, you can see that it points to assurance. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. And the proper context is who is him? Jesus Christ. First uh, John chapter 2, verse 28. This has to deal with, uh, again, assurance or whatever. First John chapter 2, verse 28. Does anybody have it? <coughs> And now, little children, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at this at his coming. So, what kind of confidence are we assured that Jesus Christ is going to come? Yeah. yeah. Well, at least you should. Did he say he was going to come again? Yeah. yeah. Can anybody show me in the Bible where God said something that he was going to do and he didn't, doesn't do it? <laughs> Other than un, unfulfilled prophecy yet? No. If he says he's going to do it, it's going to get done. It's going to get done. So if he says he's coming back, he's coming back. Stay in 1 John, uh, verse 5, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. Once again, it's our confidence, our assurance, our, our guarantee in him uh, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So, of course, the catch in that verse is what? His will. Yeah. According to his will. Well, that's the fine print. <laughs> so, but, but if you fulfill the fine print, that's confidence. That's assurance. Yes, Amen. And like uh, for the negative context of uh, uh, verses uh, uh, Philippians chapter three, verses uh, uh, three and four are the only two that you really find any negative uh, context of confidence. And now let's go into that third. Uh, Galatians chapter five, verse ten. I started off with this verse because it gives us the, conf the context of how we should have confidence in our brother. Galatians chapter 5, verse 10. Does anybody have it? I have confidence in you through the Lord, that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Mm -hmm. So our confidence in other believers should be based on the Lord. through the Lord, our confidence in God. His assurance to us is his assurance to who else? If God's assured me that I'm saved and I'm heaven bound and God's assured you that you're saved and you're heaven bound, can I have confidence through the Lord that he's going to take me, not only is he going to take me home, but he's going to take who else home? You. That's right. I can't, I can't have confidence that you're going to make it to heaven because of you. I have confidence that you're going to make it to heaven because of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. Now, 
Paul, I notice, when he uses the word confidence in a lot of these verses, it's for encouragement. He's confident in the people that he has taught, that he's encouraging them to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. And I wrote this same thing unto you, lest when I come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. So what's Paul doing right there? He's exhorting, he's encouraging, he's edifying the brethren. He's he has confidence in his brethren that they would be what? Joyful. And, this, and I wrote the same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Stay in 2 Corinthians, go to uh, chapter 7, verse 16. So these, these references that Paul are making to the believers, well, mostly when you see the word confidence in this context uh, as a regarding believer, it's for encouragement. It says, I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. Now the, now the all things, the context there is all things that Paul has provided doctrine for. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, uh, We have sent them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but, not, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. So Paul is telling the believers, he's encouraging them to do what's right, to do to follow his doctrine. And then uh, Philemon, verse 21. Does anybody have that? Last, last epistle of Paul. Or chapter 1, verse 21, if you want. Who was the reference prior to that one, brother? Oh, uh, the prior to that one was uh, 2 Corinthians 8.22. Thank you. Having confidence in the obedience that wrote unto thee, knowing that thou also be in the Lord's hand. Yeah, so Paul is, Paul is confident in Philemon that he is going to do what? The right thing. His confidence is based on what? We go back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 10. Through the Lord. Through the Lord. Okay, so now let's get into, we'll just literally begin the, the, the next portion. We're going to move into chapter 6. Uh, did anybody find that interesting, by the way? The, it's, it's, it's interesting once in a while, you know, when you just get a word and you do a word study on it. It's, it really leads you to some good stuff or whatever. So, but, but just kind of remember that confidence in brethren is based on your confidence in God. Right? It's got to be through the Lord. Through yeah. obedience to the Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. That the brethren still Yeah. It's hard. That's hard. Yeah, that's hard. That's a hard concept for me. Is there very many people you can have confidence in? The brethren? The brethren disappoint? Have I ever disappointed you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people disappoint each other, brother. But when you, you got to get the proper context of your confidence in, 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 uh, in fellow believers is through the Lord. Through the Lord. Um, is, I mean, isn't a follow-up the, the in Galatians five with ten? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So that's also referring to the believers. Yeah. What does well, it mean to cut them off, though? Well, if, if, if they're caught up in sin or if they're doing a false doctrine or if they're, or if they're false teachers uh, or if they're within sin, yeah, you don't want to associate with them. All right, verse. Uh, I'll, I'll read. I'll, I'll, I'll read the verses together to get the proper uh, flow here, and then we'll get into verse five a little bit. It says, "I'll do verse four again." Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, and any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And then Paul goes through his resume of his self righteousness before this is set, before he was saved. And please keep that in mind as we go through these next two verses. Okay, I in no way, shape, or form, I am saying anything negative of, about Paul. Okay, this is Paul in his pre-saved state. And this is the example he's providing believers. Paul felt that there was nobody more self-righteous uh, than him before he got saved. After he got saved is a good contrast. What did he think after he got saved? And when we go through this lesson, this, this, uh, this mindset becomes even more profound. Paul, before he got saved, as we'll read through the scriptures, Believed that he was a super, super Hebrew. He was, I mean, he was up there. After he got saved, and, and even from all his trials, what did Paul consider himself the chief to be? Chief of sinners. <laughs> what a contrast. What a contrast. And, and, uh, and self-righteousness, is, is that more prevalent in the educational aspect of it more and educate people that are well educated well as I'm studying as I'm studying self-righteousness you know based on this yeah. it seems to be rooted in in belief in God more times than not it begins with scripture and then things get added Right, when you really boil down, what is religion? What, what really are the rules of religion? Doing Man's good. religion. Works. Man is basically works. good. Yeah. Okay? And it's works. Works. Well, uh, well I'll, I'll pick on the Catholics or whatever. Okay? <laughs> the reason why I pick on a Catholic because I was a Catholic. So, uh, we had the Bible. It was the Catholic Bible, but we had the Bible. But you can go to a hundred priests, and maybe two or three would know what you're referencing in the Bible. But we also had this this uh, uh, doctrine called catechism. Now you go to a hundred priests, and a hundred priests will tell you anything out of the doctrine. Of Catechism. Very little can tell you uh, the doctrine out of the Bible. But the doctrine of catechism, oh, we had it down. We had it down. So, uh, and, and when you study the Pharisees, which Paul was, and, and we'll, we'll get to this, is the Pharisees started off with the Torah. Okay? That they, they started off and they, they were going to try to be Strictly living exclusively to the, the jot and tittle of the law. And as the years progressed, and we'll see in the scripture or whatever, what you find is the law, law was pretty good, covered a lot of stuff. However, God missed this. We should, we should wash our hands. Oh, God missed this. We should wash our mouths. Oh, God missed this. Oh, God missed that. God missed this. So you start to see all these other things start getting piled up. Basically, Catholicism states, and they, you can find it in any of their written things, that tradition.
position is equal in the scripture. Exactly. And we see that in the, and we'll see that in the New Testament and the Gospels that the it got to the point with the Pharisees, the sects of the of the, the Pharisees, that their traditions basically pushed out the Torah, the book, the books of Moses. And you you they were living based on those rules. Uh, the Lord said to the Pharisees, your traditions that made them not affect the word. Exactly, and we're going to be getting to those. So, so when Paul starts talking about, and then when we start learning a little bit about the Pharisees, Paul will see that Paul lived, lived a life of the Pharisees. It's one thing to be a Pharisee, it's another thing to live the life of a Pharisee. Case in point. Are you saved? Right? Are you a Christian? Yep. Right? So we're Christians, but do we live the life of a Christian? Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference, and we'll see in the study of Paul and his pre-saved state, not only did he boast of being a Pharisee, which was, you know, Pharisees felt that they were high above uh, any run-of-the-mill Hebrew, but Paul even felt that <laughs> hey, he's, he's in the upper echelon of the Pharisees as well. And regarding the law, blameless. Blameless. Yeah. Well, he proved it by his life. Right, right. So, okay. Oh, well, that, it's good that we talk like this because uh, uh, I'll start that, that new uh, uh, verse 6 fresh next week. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions of what we covered today? Fiddler on the roof. Fiddler on the roof, yeah. Traditions. I, used, I love all the music. That's a lead song. Is it a musical? Yeah. Never saw it. That's a lead song going into it. Oh, it's cool. No, I don't do musicals. Tara, on the other hand, she loves musicals. That's a lead song going into it. Fiddler on the roof is a musical. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. It's good. Good book, Brother Ed, you want to close us in a word of prayer? Sure. Father, thank you for the lesson that we learned this morning about confidence help our confidence always to be fixed upon your word and in you and the father if we can have confidence in one another may it always be through uh, the word of god and, and the lord jesus christ in your name we pray amen, amen.